David writes in Psalm 53, The fool says in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Well, good morning. Usually I try to start our service off with a nice cheerful psalm about praising the Lord, but this week in our daily readings, both psalms were kind of down psalms that pointed out the iniquities of man, and I thought, well, that's okay, it's still appropriate, because there's a reality that we come and we gather this morning because we are indeed sinners, but we have a great Savior, and we're here this morning to worship our Savior because we are not good, there is none who is righteous, as Paul writes in his uh, his letter to the Romans. So uh, it's my privilege to welcome you this morning to Kingsway Alliance Church. Glad you can be here with us this morning. Just a few announcements as we get started in our service. Actually, I have uh, several different announcements. First, I uh, just want to say a quick thank you to everybody who helped with the uh, Kenmore First Fridays. We had a little table set up and gave out waters and um, half frozen popsicles to the many kids who came up. So not pictured is Kirk, who helped orchestrate a lot of this. Also, um, Jody was hiding during the picture. She was there too. So anyway, it was, I appreciate those who helped. It was a good time, but um, it was a good opportunity, I think, just to get our name out there and have a presence in the community of Kenmore. It was also a great reminder of just the need for the gospel in and around uh, our neighborhood here. So uh, with that, I just want to encourage you, there's actually one more of these, September 2nd, and we're going to try to do the same thing again, uh, maybe uh, do a couple things slightly differently, but uh, just mark your calendar if that's a date where you are available um, and you're interested. It's an opportunity. You can either come and serve, ha- pass out waters, or if you enjoy engaging in conversation with people, there's plenty of opportunity to do that as well. So mark that on your calendar. I'll try to put that in front of you a couple more times before uh, it approaches. So um, also... Uh, the Kingsway Wednesdays. We've been uh, trying to. I've been trying to think through starting this back up again, and um, so, sort of we're going to aim for the middle of September. Uh, partly, I have district conference coming up right before then, and I didn't want to start it up the week I was going or going to be gone. So we're going to start it up September 21st. It will be the first day for that. So just mark your calendars. We'll give you more information on that, uh, but it gives you just a little bit of time to. Uh, Figure out your schedule. I know for those who have kids going back to school, kind of get back into the groove of everything. But again, just a reminder, there's kind of a women's study, a men's study, um, and then we have the kids program going on each week as well. So uh, we'll have more information coming about that also. And then uh, lastly, the missions conference, our annual missions conference is coming up September 23rd through the 25th. And we will have uh, speakers, Peter and Laura Marshall, who uh, this they just retired from the field, so their final year of service is spent traveling around to different churches and sharing about what the Lord has done uh, with and through them. They've most recently served in the country of uh, Uruguay, and so they will be here with us, and uh, we'll have an opportunity to hear about the Lord's work around the world. So I encourage you, write those dates down. I'll give you more information in coming weeks about that as well. Um, also, not I don't have a slide for this, but just a reminder, if you are part of Jeff's God Sighting study, that's meeting this week. Is that correct? That's correct? Okay, at 7 p.m. If you have questions, you can see Jeff over there or just show up. Um, and then we also still are doing the backpack drive. So if you want to take a backpack and fill it um, for the local elementary school, just bring that back t- by August uh, 21st. Yeah, Joe. Okay, apparently all the backpacks have been adopted, so you'll have to find somebody in the parking lot and steal one from them if you want to get one or something. So um, anyway, if, if you do have questions about that, you can see Joan Shaw for more details. So, All right, thanks for bearing with me. I just want to turn back to that same psalm, Psalm 53. At the very end, David writes this. He says, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when God restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. Well, there's a promise we have that the Lord is coming and he will restore his people. That same Lord Jesus, he came and did that on the cross to offer salvation to us. And that's why we gather here each Sunday is to celebrate and worship the Lord. So would you stand with us now 
as we have the opportunity here to join together as one body and one voice, worshiping the Lord. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, the gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Amen. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. 
Well, might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Thus might I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears. Dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt my eyes to tears. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Actually, you can stay standing if you want, because we're going to dismiss the children to Children's Church. And I encourage you to just take a moment and greet those seated around you. Um, say hello to a familiar face or unfamiliar face. And, and just uh, as the kids are heading out, take a moment to do that and greet each other now. I take a moment to pray for our offering this morning. Lord, we are reminded of those words at the cross, at the cross where I first uh, saw the light. Lord, it is there where we received our sight. Through your death and resurrection, we go from blind to be able to see, Lord. And I pray for us this morning, for each and every one of us in here that would be true of us in our lives, that we've surrendered our life to you, Lord, and that you have touched us and you've saved us and rescued us from our sins. And God, as we come before you now to give our offering, I ask, Lord, that our giving would be uh, a gift out of the generosity that pours out from our heart, out of gratitude for what you have done in our lives. Would you be honored this morning and glorified in this time of giving in Jesus' name?
Morning. Morning. Today's scripture reading is Mark chapter 12, uh, 1 through 12. It's on page 37 of your Pew Bible. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a vat underneath the wine press and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a slave to vine growers in order to receive some of the produce from the vineyard from the vine growers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another, and that one they killed. And so with many others, beating and killing others. He had no more to send. A beloved son, he sent him last of all, saying to them, they will respect my son. But those vine growers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner do? What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine growers and will give the vine vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The the stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to seize him. Yet they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke the parable against them. And so they left him and went away. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. Father, we just uh, thank you that you have washed away our sins through the blood of Jesus. We thank you for that. And Father, there are many among us who are sick with COVID and, and other diseases, Father, and, and we just uh, should be here that just would want to be here but cannot be. We just uh, ask that you would heal each one, Father, and As we give you praise, we ask that you uh, speak through Eric as he brings the word to us. And we just give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Link, for leading us in singing, and John for reading the word of the Lord to us this morning. Um, I... It's on my mind this morning, uh, there, there are a number of people who are out who are sick this week, and uh, COVID seems to be continually surrounding us uh, nowadays, so um, as, before I started my service, I also know there's a lot of other needs in the body as well, so um, I know John just prayed, but I just want to take a moment now just to pray for the congregation and for the many needs for those who are unable to be here with us this morning, so. Would you bow with me? Lord, I uh, just am reminded that you are sovereign over all things. As I've been preparing to preach this morning, that message has been made clear to me. And, and Lord, um, I just pray for those who can't be here, can't join us now uh, physically. Uh, maybe they're watching online. Would you just touch those who are not feeling well, who are sick? Um, Lord, I know there are many others, uh, not with COVID, with other um, with other issues, Lord, and they need a touch from you. And so, God, this morning, I pray that uh, you would just be a source of comfort to all who are struggling, both physically, uh, Lord, maybe emotionally, spiritually. Would you be there? Would you come beside them? And would you comfort them? And Lord, I pray for us as a, a body of believers. Would we, would we be faithful in our love for one another? Lord, would we faithfully bear each other's burdens? Would we be a church, a body that comes alongside one another and helps each other through these times of trouble and difficulties. Lord, would you be glorified even in the midst of challenges? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's a privilege to be back here again with you guys. Thank you to John who preached last week. Um, 
Uh, got to listen to his message uh, online on, on humility, and I appreciated uh, just his, his word and uh, even his personal conf- confession. It's always good to make me feel a little better that I'm not the only one. So uh, thank you, John, for doing that. And uh, well, this morning we're just going to be back in the in the Gospel of Mark. You can turn your Bibles there. And I was racking my brain this morning. I always try to think of some way I can have an introduction. And I'll be honest, this morning's passage is a parable, and I find parables to be awfully difficult to preach through at times. And, and maybe it's because I'm not much of a literary person. When I, when I grew up, I didn't like reading. In fact, I especially despised reading things that were allegories. Uh, because they just didn't make sense to me. So, uh, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia, you've maybe heard of that series. It's an allegorical tale where uh, there's different characters and they represent different things uh, in life. You know, in Chronicles of Narnia, you have, uh, you have Aslan, the great lion who represents the Lord. And, and I never really enjoyed those books because I struggled to understand them, to be honest with you. So, uh, so I couldn't think of any great introduction this morning. But one thing I thought of is, this is a parable told by Jesus, and that's very much what it is. It's an allegory that he tells the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the Sanhedrin. So we're going to dig into that and try to take meaning. What is it that Jesus is teaching them? Because uh, this parable is very different than the others that Jesus has taught throughout the rest of his ministry. It's unique in that it is not a parable where he keeps things hidden. You know his other parables? He keeps things concealed, right? It's only the disciples who see what Jesus is meaning. He, in fact, he takes them aside often and he explains the parable to them. But this is not one of those. He speaks of this parable and it's very directed at the religious leaders and there's no explanation needed. Um, but we'll give some extra explanation anyway because we need it. So, uh, If you do have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. And just for those who weren't here the last few weeks, we've been going through this Gospel, and we've seen this is Jesus' final week of ministry. He's in Jerusalem, and he's been in the temple. Um, And I'll just throw a picture of the temple up here so you can kind of get an idea of what we presume it looked like. And Jesus was going back and forth in the temple each day, teaching. And where we saw it last, we're in Mark two weeks ago, we saw Jesus's authority was questioned by the Sanhedrin, that group of priests and scribes and elders. They were kind of the the religious leaders of the Israelite people, of the people of God. And so they challenged Jesus's authority and they tried to trap him. Do you remember that? They asked him a question. They said, where do you get, where does your authority come from, Jesus? They want him to verbally express that he's the son of God, because that's what Jesus has implied throughout his ministry. For them, that would be blasphemy, enough for them to arrest him and rid themselves of this problem, Jesus. But Jesus doesn't fall into that trap. He engages in a debate with them. And if you remember, he asks them a question back in chapter 11, verse 30. And he says, was the bat-, he says, answer this question and I'll answer you yours. He says, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Meaning, was it from God or was it from man? And he put them in a pickle, so to speak, because if they answered, oh, it's from, from, from God, then they would very much be validating Jesus, that he is the Son of God, because it was John himself who declared Jesus to be the one, the prophet that he had been prophesying about, the Son of God, the promised Messiah. But if they said he was from man, the people who thought John was a prophet, prophet would have been greatly upset. So, Instead of engaging in the debate, they just simply say, we don't know. And they don't answer, and Jesus doesn't answer them either. And that's kind of where the story left off. And so this morning, as we pick up in chapter 12, verse 1, it's just a continuation of that same scene, okay? So imagine Jesus is there, he finishes telling them that, and he immediately goes into teaching this parable in in verse in verse 1. But before we look at that, just want to give you a quick outline. In this passage, what we're going to see is a parable that Jesus tells, and it's the majority of the passage. But then he recounts a psalm. From Psalm 118, it's just two verses, verses 10 and 11. And then the final verse is the plot. The plot of the religious leaders after Jesus' teaching. Now, the parable, as I mentioned, was a way that Jesus often communicated primarily secret messages, so to speak, to his disciples because he didn't want people to know and understand. But this parable is very different. In fact, verse 12 makes it clear that the religious leaders rightly perceived and understood exactly what Jesus was saying to them. 
It says in the middle of that verse, it says, for they understood that he spoke the parable against them. We're going to get there. But they understand this parable because it's not a secret to them. It's not intended to be that. So look there with me, verse 1 of chapter 12. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and he put a wall around it and he dug a vat under the wine press and he built a tower and rented it out to the vine growers and went on a journey. Now, just I'm going to make some comments as we go through this. As I mentioned, this is an allegory, right? So who are the characters in this parable so far? Well, there's the man. Well, who's the man? The man is the Lord, okay? The man is the Lord. And the next thing you see is there's a vineyard, a vineyard. Now, one thing to note about a vineyard is this is a very common and well-known symbol all throughout the Old Testament that symbolizes Israel, And specifically, when the vineyard is talked about, it's most often a symbol of God's relationship with the Israelite people. That's what a vineyard represents. It represents the people of God and his relationship as the caretaker of the vineyard of his people. So it's God's dealings with Israel. And then there's these vine growers, it calls them in the NASB here. These these people, they were basically, they were tenant farmers. They were people who rented the land from the man, and they took care of the land. Now, the, 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 it says here that, that a man planted a vineyard. That's interesting. So it's the man who plants. They simply come and take care of it, and they're to care for the vineyard. Now, these aren't some poor, downtrodden farmers. In fact, this was a common practice of the day that people would rent out their land to commercial farmers, and they would take care of the land, and then they would pay their rent, Right? So then there's some other details here. Those are the the big things you need to understand. There's these other details where it talks about a wall and a vat and all these, a tower. And uh, primarily the reason those are put there is because when Jesus tells this parable, he is paralleling a passage from Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah 5. I'm going to turn there. You can if you want. I'm just going to read Isaiah 5 verses I'll start with just verses, uh, first couple of verses here. Um, as I get there, Isaiah chapter 5. This passage is known as Isaiah's song. A song in which Isaiah basically gives his own psalm, and it's a prophecy against the unfaithfulness of Israel as a nation. So if you turn Isaiah 5, it starts out, Let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard, My well-beloved had a vineyard, meaning the Lord, had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around. He removed its stones and planted it with the choicest of vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it, and he also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. You can just pause there at the end of verse 2. This passage parallels this Isaiah's passage, his song, And Jesus does that intentionally. Remember, these are the religious leaders. They know and understand the Old Testament law. They know and understand the prophets. They studied the word. They they, they didn't necessarily understand, but they knew the word. And they would have known this song of Isaiah. So, So the rest of this, these details in this are meant to point us to this specific passage as it would have pointed the religious leaders. So they know exactly what Jesus is talking about and what he's doing. So that's kind of the main point. Let's go on to verse 2. He moves on. He says, At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers in order to receive some of the produce of the vineyard from the vine growers. So at harvest time simply means that there was a prearranged time, an agreed upon time, where the people who took care of the vineyard would provide payment. They didn't provide payment initially because they had to care for the vineyard. It took years for the vineyard to go from planting seeds to being a vineyard that produced. And so there was agreed upon time to do that. Much like there was a covenant between God and his people of Israel. There was agreed upon arrangements, a harvest time that was coming. But then we see an introduction of another character here, the slave. Now who is the slave? If you have the NIV, it probably reads servant, right? Who is this? Well, this simply represents the prophets, the Old Testament prophets who were sent to the Israelite people. Now, it's interesting, the NIV uses servant because it comes from the Greek word doulos, which is 
which means slave, but it also has something to do with giving the idea that you are a servant. But here's the reality. It's, we, we avoid using the word slave because it has a lot of other connotations at times. But there's a reality that when you're a servant of the Lord, you belong to him fully. You're fully dedicated to the Lord. And you in the, and thus, in that sense, it's as if you are a slave of the Lord. So the word here used really is slave, and it kind of carries that idea. So he sends his servant his slave, so to speak, to the people. A servant goes to the vineyard, and the Lord thus sends prophets to Israel. Verse 3, they look to him, and they beat him, and they send him away empty-handed. There's three things that happen. They seize him, they take control of him, they beat him, they send him away. The way that they treat the servant of the master, of the owner of the property, is somewhat incomprehensible. Ultimately, what they're doing is they are challenging the authority of this man, challenging the demands and giving demands to him. Verse 4 says, Again, he sent them another slave, and they wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully. Now, this idea of wounding him in the head, we don't know exactly what it means, but here's an idea. There's a downward progression, right? First, one servant goes, and they treat him poorly. And next servant goes, and they treat him even worse, right? So it's escalating. And then verse 5, and he sent another, and that one they killed, and so with many others, beating some and killing others. So at this point, as you're reading this, hearing this, the master continues to send these servants over and over. He seems undeterred by the treatment of the first two servants and even the third, even though they're treated more harshly. Again, this is pointing to and highlighting directly the prophets of the Old Testament. Over and over and over, the Lord sent prophets to Israel as a nation to warn them. Over and over, he warned them of their behavior. He called for them to come back to him. And over and over, they treated the prophets the same way. They beat them, they harmed them, they killed some. It's exactly what the religious leaders did, what the Israelite people did did. But I think just note this point here. In some senses, it seems like the master's patience is sort of endless. And I think there's a reality for us that the generosity of the Lord is that he continually sent servants. He continually gave them opportunities to experience his grace. His grace is far more gracious than we ever deserve or could imagine. Now, at this point, I would say the story starts to almost sound a little bit absurd. Who, who would continue to send more messengers? Who would continue to put up with this kind of behavior? Well, what does the, the owner do? The landowner? The Lord? He had, verse 6, he had one more to send, a beloved son. He sent him last of all to them, saying, they will respect my son. He has only one person left to send. That is his son. Obviously a reference to Jesus. The final character in this allegory, the son of God. Now there's something clearly different between these servants, these slaves, and this beloved son who is sent. He calls him a beloved son. In fact, that should remind us of the words of the Lord and in Mark 1, verse 11. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized? He came up, and what did God say? That You are my son. It is in you that I am well pleased. Or my beloved son, I'm sorry. You are my beloved son. It should remind us of those words. There's only three times in the whole, in the whole gospel of Mark where we see those words, beloved son. At Jesus' baptism, his transfiguration, and right here, in this parable. There is a uniqueness to the beloved son that is like no other. He's not just another servant. He's not just another slave. He is the beloved son. One commentator wrote this. He says, this is not just one more attempt to collect from the people, but it's God's last appeal to Israel. And it is through his beloved son. It's his last appeal to collect from Israel. That's sort of the idea being conveyed here. Now again, I've said, and I'll say this a few times, 
There's an absurdity to this story, to this parable. You read it, and it's kind of ridiculous sounding. It seems crazy that a landowner would send his only son into a situation like that, where these, where these tenants have been beating, mocking, and killing all the people that you have sent. Who would send their only son into a situation like that? There's an absurdity in that sense, but there's an absurdity by the tenant's actions. And there's almost an absurdity by the, the landowner's continual grace. But here's the reality. God's grace, in some senses, is absurdly amazing. How is it that God, the creator of this universe, sends his only beloved son down to this earth to be rejected, to be beaten, to be disgraced, and to ultimately give up his own life for the sake of sinners? It is an absurd message, isn't it? And yet that's the gospel message. After continual rejection and disgrace, God provides a final option. Verse 7. But those vine growers, they said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. They took him, they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. A ridiculous conclusion that they come up with, isn't it? It's the son of the owner. What are we going to do? We're going to kill him. That's their idea for getting rid of their debt. They owe the landowner a great debt. And what's their idea of getting rid of him? Let's kill the landowner's son. As if the landowner himself is incapable of coming down to collect that debt. It seems ridiculous. It sounds ridiculous. But how often, I wonder, in our own life, do we treat God in that same way? He sent his son, and we turn from him. We don't look to him. Perhaps we mock, perhaps we ridicule, thinking all along that the Lord himself, he's not surely going to come and collect on that debt. That's what our actions say, oftentimes. This story should strike us as ridiculous, I think. Because it is ridiculous. The killing of the servant's son will not ever pay their debt. There's a reality for these tenants, there's a reality for us that we owe a great debt because of our sin. The debt from our sin is massive. It's a debt that we could never repay. It's almost like you have a credit card, right? Maybe some of you have experienced this at a time in life where you get into debt in your credit card, well, there's only really one way to take care of that credit card debt. It's to pay it, right? It doesn't matter if you take the card and cut it into a million pieces. You could light it on fire. You could flush it down the toilet. You could do whatever you want with that card, but the debt goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. It's still there. Their thought is absurd. Let's kill the son. And then God will just forget about our debt, right? Our debt is there, and that debt will be paid. And someday the Lord will come to collect payment for that debt. No matter how absurd your actions might be, He is coming to collect on that debt, the debt of your sin. And Jesus ends the parable kind of with this rhetorical question, in verse 9, he says this, What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine growers, and he will give the vineyard to others. Jesus makes very clear the point of this parable to them through this question. For those who reject the Son, they will be destroyed. This is more than just a simple physical death. It talks about complete destruction that's indicated here. There's actually three different things he says. He says the Lord will come, much like they didn't expect. He will destroy them. What were they trying to do with Jesus? They were seeking to destroy him because his power, his authority was a threat to theirs. But it is they who will be destroyed. And the Lord will give the vineyard away to others. This is kind of symbolic here of the fact that the religious leaders 
the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the Pharisees, they are being replaced. It is no longer they who are the religious leaders, but in fact it is the followers of Jesus who are put in that place. And it's not just they who are being replaced, it is the entire temple system that is being replaced. This temple that used to represent the Lord, this temple that had significant meaning, that was the place where you met with God, it was the place where you performed sacrifices, where your sins were atoned for, it is no longer necessary. Jesus is coming, and Jesus is replacing that temple. He is the replacement of the temple. I just think we need to note here, there is no escaping the judgment of the Lord. As we look at this, that debt will be paid no matter who you are, no matter how religious or not religious you are, he will come to collect the payment of that debt, that debt of our sin. It must be paid for. And there's only one way that that debt is removed from us, and that's through Jesus, his beloved son. So there's ultimate bad news that is eclipsed by the greatest news of the sacrifice of the beloved Son. But that's only for those who recognize Him, for those who know Him, for those who repent of their sins and put their faith alone in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, that's kind of the end of this parable. It seems, like I said, sort of absurd and maybe strange in some ways. But the message was very clear to the religious leaders. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He transitions He follows that up with a psalm. Psalm 118 is where it comes from. And before Jesus says the two stanzas from this psalm, he makes one comment to them at the beginning of verse 10. If you look there, you'll see his one comment. What is it that he says? He says, have you not even read the scriptures? Now there's one thing to know about this psalm specifically. Psalm 118 is a psalm, a Hallel psalm, which meant that it was a psalm that was recited at the Passover feast. It was a very common psalm that the religious leaders most definitely would have had memorized, especially this is the time of Passover. It was a psalm that would have been very fresh in people's minds. And Jesus chooses this psalm knowing full well they know this. They've they've got it memorized. So what is he saying? Have you not read The scriptures, obviously they have. What he's saying here is, you must assuredly have read this, you know this, but obviously you do not understand. That's what Jesus is saying. And then he goes on, look at the psalm, verse 10. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. There's a shifting of imagery, an imagery from agriculture to architecture, but it also shifts from an image of judgment against the religious leaders to vindication of the beloved son. From judgment to the, from them to the vindication of the beloved son. The stone here obviously is a reference to Jesus, and just like the religious leaders, they were the tenant farmers, here they are the builders, right? The builders of the kingdom in a sense. That's what they were tasked with. That's what they were charged with, watching over and caring for the people of God. But they'd failed to do that. They had forgotten God long ago. That's the connection to the passage above. But what does he say here? The stone that the builders rejected, Jesus, has been rejected, becomes the chief cornerstone. You've probably heard this analogy, this reference many times before, and to be honest, there's some debate exactly what that means, but here's, here's kind of the bottom line. Whatever it means precisely is that we may not know the precise meaning, but it is the most important stone in the entire building. One commentator describes this stone as something they would call a measuring stone. It's almost like a stone that they would get, and it would be so perfect That it's the stone that they would compare every other stone for the building against. You would look at it and you'd say, this this stone has the right angles just right. And every other stone was compared up against that stone. Because it was the stone that was perfect, so to speak. In fact, I... I, I've never built much with stones, but um, when we were in Taiwan, my wife, she likes putting these collages on the wall of pictures. And, and so in Taiwan, it was a challenge because our walls were concrete and, and I, wasn't, I didn't have any cool tools. So our, our collage looked kind of terrible, to be honest. It was, you know, you just kind of got the nail in the wall wherever you could. 
And uh, we came back to the U.S., and my wife wanted to put a big collage of pictures up on the wall, and I thought, all right, my, my, usually my, my rule of thumb is for every project my wife wants, I should get at least a good tool out of the deal. So I told her, I'm going to go buy a laser level, not knowing that these are, like, ridiculously expensive. So unfortunately, I had to get, like, bottom-of-the-barrel laser level, but it was still, you know, probably, like, at least $90 or something. But I will tell you, there is no tool I am more thankful that I've bought in my life than a laser level. It transforms everything. It, it just... It has this precise line everywhere, right? It gives you that perfect right angle that you need. If you're building walls, it makes everything perfect. It makes it so much easier. In one sense, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, it is that stone by which everything is measured against. It is the standard that we must go by. The most important foundational stone that there is. That's who Jesus is in the, in the building of a structure. Here's the point of this. The son who is being rejected by the ones in charge of the temple, the building that's supposed to represent the Lord, it is that very son that's been rejected who is the most important and foundational piece of God's design. Not just specifically God's design for redemption, God is the ultimate architecture of his kingdom, and he uses Jesus as that foundational piece, the one by which we judge everything else by. So although the religious leaders have rejected Jesus, although they have doubted his authority, they downplayed his teachings, they discredited his miracles, they've sought to destroy his life, God's design is that Jesus, his beloved and only son, is the most foundational piece in the building of his kingdom kingdom. See, the temple is being replaced, and it is Jesus who's replacing that building. A new temple is being built, but it's not a temple built by brick and mortar. It's a temple that is built by the people of God, and they are built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, and the people of God are meant to become, they're formed and are conformed to be like Christ, like that measurement stone. In a sense, it's like God takes us and he chisels away the sin in our life. We must be rid of that sin so that we perfectly reflect who Christ is. That's the idea of the chief cornerstone here in this image. The temple is being replaced by Jesus. And it is in and through Jesus that the foundation of God's grace is built upon. He is the measuring stone for our eternal life. Now, as we look at this, there's something, as we come to verse 11, we understand this idea of a cornerstone, but there's a couple things in verse 11 that I think are absolutely crucial for us to understand. Look here, the plan of the Lord, the sovereign plan of the Lord, verse 11, this came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Here's the reality. We can look over that and we can we cannot see the importance of that. It was God's sovereign plan that he sent his one and only son to be the son who would be rejected, right? He sent that stone to the builders knowing that he would be cast aside and thrown out and rejected. Because God also knew and providentially planned and ordained that Jesus Christ would be vindicated, the Son of God would be vindicated, and it was through His vindication that God's grace would be founded in. God's plans are sometimes difficult for us to understand. Sometimes we don't see and understand how everything happens or why everything happens. But I love the end of this verse. What do they do? They see the Lord of the plan, and it is marvelous in our eyes. It's marvelous. What's marvelous? God's wonderful plan. That God made a way for sinners who were in desperate need of salvation. He used His only beloved Son. He gave Him over to the evils of this world in a sense. Yet, God's bigger than that. And God uses what man intended for evil for his own 
purpose, his own intentions, and to carry out his own plan of salvation. We should marvel at the grace of God that has been extended to all peoples. Again, we don't always know the exact reason or timing for certain things. There are things in life that are hard to understand, difficult to understand. But this much I know as I look at Scripture, and I think we should see this. The plan of the Father is something we should marvel at. The psalmist writes, oh, how marvelous are the works of the Lord. In the book of Revelation, John captures a picture that he sees of a vision that he's given of heaven in chapter 15, and he writes this, and they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Do you hear that? Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord, the Almighty. I wonder this morning, do you marvel at the providence of God? Do you look at your life and see how marvelous the works of the Lord are? Now, if you're like me, marveling or being utterly astonished and amazed at the grace of God, it is not something I do often enough. I'm just going to be honest with you. We get so comfortable, I think, in our Christian walk, and our Christian faith, and we do not rightly marvel at what God is doing in our life, what God has done in people's lives all around us. We get comfortable with it, and we forget about how amazing and wonderful and glorious are the works of the Lord. In fact, just this week, I found myself yet again complaining to myself, even to my wife at times, about different events in my life, not understanding why would God allow this? Why does God allow that? I'm complaining. I'm not marveling. I have nothing to complain about. There's nothing that can compare to the goodness of God's mercy in my life. I should be marveling at that that God has extended His grace to me, a sinner who is very much undeserved. That leads the people, verse 12, we'll finish this out. And they were seeking to seize Him. And yet they feared the people, the crowd meaning, for they understood that He spoke the parable against them. And so they left Him and they went away. Here's the reality. The religious leaders have every reason to marvel, but they don't marvel at all. And they understand that Jesus is seeking judgment against them. He's pronouncing a judgment against them. They are enraged and they want to put an end to this Jesus. But they can't now because of the crowd. Ironically, that very crowd will be a crowd just two days later who will be chanting, crucify him. But here it is. They too are looking in astonishment at the authority of Jesus. So the religious leaders will seek other methods and we're going to see that in coming weeks. Well, what's the point of all this? What's the point of this passage when it comes in the Gospel of Mark? Here, I think, is the first thing that we we have to see is Jesus has come to replace the temple. It is in the temple courts where he's standing and teaching and it is against the temple leaders that Jesus is pronouncing this judgment on them. Jesus, who is God's beloved Son, it is He who has been sent, and it is He who will be rejected, who will be vindicated, and who will become the chief cornerstone of the new temple. Again, not something with brick and mortar. It is a temple that is built foundationally with Jesus Christ, and it is built with believers in Jesus. We, the people of God, are the temple. The church. There is a new work that Jesus or that the Lord is doing here through Jesus Christ. The Lord is leading his people out of the exile of their sins and out of death and into a new life that is in Christ and Christ alone. Secondly, 
Notice, for those who reject the vineyard owner's continual offers of grace, there will be a just judgment. That's a reality that we must not deny, that we must not look away from. They will be completely destroyed, the text tells us. That's what will happen to the religious leaders of Israel and anybody else who rejects the beloved Son of God. They will be destroyed. They are completely replaced, the religious leaders. They no longer have a place in God's kingdom. Third, just note the shocking absurdity of this story and that it is the divine plan of the Father. I said already, I think verse 11 is so crucial that we understand that this was the plan of the Lord, that His beloved Son would be rejected, that He would be that stone that is cast aside. But the Lord does a marvelous work. He uses His Son, the very one who's rejected, for the salvation of all peoples. And we should marvel at that. So what does this mean for you and me How does this impact us and our walk with the Lord? Well, I already said this, but I just want to say this again because I think this is something we cannot miss. Do you marvel at the providential and sometimes seemingly absurd plan of the Lord? Do you see the story of the gospel in your life? Do you see that you are a sinner and that you are in need of a Savior? That your sins condemn you to hell? And that there's no way that debt of sin can be paid for apart from the beloved Son of God who's come on the cross. As Scripture tells us to be a propitiation for our sin. He took our punishment in our place. He's a substitution for us. And He bears the penalty for that sin. So that we can be justified before a holy God. For those who repent of their sin and put their faith and belief in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior. That's how you have new life in Christ. That should be something we marvel at. Again, I already told you, it's hard sometimes, isn't it? To marvel at that. If you marvel at that, how does that affect you, I'm wondering? In your daily life, are you one who is eager to share about the glorious good news of Jesus Christ with those around you? Is your life spent in a way that is obvious to others, that there's something different about you? Does your life cause others to marvel at how great and good our Lord is? Those are hard questions, aren't they? Hard questions for me to answer, to be honest. Perhaps you struggle to marvel at the Lord's plan. I think for those of us who grew up in the church, we've heard the stories, we've been exposed to Christian culture most of our life, and sometimes I think we are most at risk of not marveling at the goodness and the providential plan of the Lord. In some senses, I find myself struggling with that. Because I grew up in the church, I've heard these things, and it is so easy for us to become calloused to the, good, the story of this good news. So I want to caution you, friends, if you find yourself in that category where you find it difficult to be amazed at God's goodness, where you find it difficult to be shocked and astonished by the plan of God to rescue you out of your sins, be careful. Check your heart. Submit yourself to the Lord and examine your heart before the Lord. Ask Him to come and enter your life. It's a dangerous place to be when we do not marvel at what God has done on our behalf. He is doing a marvelous work right in front of us. Do you see it? Do you recognize it? Do you glorify Him and worship Him him because of it? I hope so. I hope that's something you do in your life. I hope that coming here on Sundays is not just something you do out of 
duty. I hope it's because you delight to look at the scripture together, that you delight to understand and see how good and marvelous and wonderful the deeds of the Lord are. Would you close with me in prayer together? Lord God, we come before you, and I confess, God, that I don't marvel at the gospel in the way that I should. Lord, would you help me? Would you help us as a congregation? Lord, as we, as we go through your word, as we read the stories of scripture, some that we've probably heard countless times, Lord, would you allow us to marvel at what an amazing thing you have done? Lord, would we marvel at the reality that there is nothing that happens beyond your sovereign providential plan. Lord, that you take and use the most horrible things of this world and you use them for your own good and for your own glory and you did that with your own son. You sent him here, an innocent, sinless, beloved son, and he was beaten, he was mocked, he was tortured unjustly. And then he was killed. But God, that wasn't the end of the story. In fact, it was all part of your plan, somehow. That you would resurrect him. That you would vindicate him. And that that very son, that beloved son, would be the foundation for which all of our faith rests. Lord, we marvel at that. God, allow us come to you regularly to confess our sin and to seek you, Lord. Would we be amazed and astonished at what a good and gracious, loving Father you are. And it's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Well, we have the opportunity this morning to gather together around the communion table. And as, uh, as the elders come up here to distribute um, the elements. I just want to say, as they're going around the room, go ahead, you can, as they're going around the room here, I encourage you, would you take a minute and would you pause and reflect in your own heart and would you ask yourself that question, Lord, do I marvel at what you're doing in my life? Do I marvel at your goodness. So if you're here this morning and you are a son or daughter of the Lord, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, I welcome you to take part, to take the elements with us together as the body of Christ. So as these pass around, uh, we'll have music playing and, and you can just take a few moments here to reflect in your own heart. Are you marveling at the goodness of the Lord? Take your elements and start working that bread portion open. I know that you can take a minute there. 
But as you do that, I just want to remind you that we come to this table and we do it monthly. And we do it as a constant reminder of what Jesus has done for us in our own lives. I mentioned earlier how easy it can be to to turn callous to the work of the Lord in our life. To forget of the goodness of the Lord. To forget of what a wonderful gift He has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. So we come together as a body of Christ to remember the Lord. And that's why we're doing that here this morning is to remember Him. So if you would take your that bread piece out from there. And these were the words of the Lord on the night in which He betrayed Sorry, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he took it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you take the bread now, eat it together, as we remember Jesus' body broken for us? As you open that, element there. In the same way, Jesus took the cup also after supper and saying, as you drink it, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, and as often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Would you take the cup together now as we drink that? Let's remember the new covenant we have in Jesus Christ. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes, Scripture tells us. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are so grateful. And Lord, truthfully, I hope that we do indeed marvel at the cross. Lord, would that be something that we don't just see and hear and move on from? But Lord, would it sink deep in our hearts and would it, would it convict us, Lord? Would it cause us to think more deeply on you and what a, an amazing Father you are? Lord, would you allow me to be more grateful for your gift of salvation? We are thankful that you have rescued us out of the depths of our sins. And Lord, I pray that we would proclaim that good news until you return. And it's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Well, would you stand with us now? We're going to sing one final closing hymn uh, before we have an opportunity for a time of prayer for healing. So stand with us now as we sing our cornerstone. We sing about this foundational stone of Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. 
Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in Him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Through the storm, He is Lord of all. Words that we need to hear that sometimes may be difficult for us to hear. Uh, this morning we have an opportunity after I give the benediction. If, if you would like prayer for healing or anointing, the elders will be up here now. I think some of you are going through those storms. Uh, in fact, uh, Debbie, who's here this morning, she will be coming up here for prayer. Um, she found out this week that she's in dire need of a liver transplant. And so we're going to be praying for her. I want you as a church to to be praying for her as well. Um, and, and I know many others have prayer needs. So I invite you to come up here after the benediction for prayer if that's something that you would desire because he alone is our cornerstone. I just want to leave you with the words of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He writes, But you were a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Amen. As you go from here this morning, I, I pray and hope that's true, that, that you know that he's called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Would you go in peace of the Lord?